and welcome to a special webinar from Spaces for Learning. I'm Matt Jones, Senior Editor of Spaces, and I'll be your moderator. Today's event is brought to you by the S4L staff and the generous support of our sponsor, ARC Facilities. Before we get started, here are a few quick housekeeping items to address. If you experience any technical difficulties during the event, please click the yellow help button located below the slide window to reach some troubleshooting resources. Use the ask a question window to the left to ask any question at any time. Within the next day or two, ARC facilities will send all registrants a link to the archived version of this session so that you can watch it again or share it with a colleague. They'll also answer any questions that weren't addressed during the presentation. Today's presentation is called Mastering School Asset Management. Our speaker is David Trask, National Director of ARC Facilities. He's a keynote speaker, Facility Voices podcast host, author, and a thought leader in the facilities management industry. His focus is on helping universities, K-12 districts, hospitals, and other organizations leverage innovative technology to drive efficiency in the facilities management industry through thought leadership and advocacy. And now, without further ado, I'd like to turn the time over to our presenter, David Trask. David, take it away. Hey, thank you, Matt, and thank you everyone for joining us today. And what we're gonna really jump in and, and talk about the current landscape, some of the challenges that, that organizations are running into, and talk about some real solutions that we, we're hearing from organizations around the country. We'll share some of those best practices with you. But really the current landscape that we see today is the loss of institutional knowledge. A lot of folks have left. They retired during during COVID or they were on the verge of retiring and they, they just decided they were going to leave. The other challenge is the current labor market. Everybody's trying to find people. They're trying to find skilled trades people, managers. We're losing people, not just to retirement, but we're losing people that are going to other jobs. Um, I've heard horror stories about how long it's taking to, to find people once someone leaves. And a lot of people are running down in their head count. We're also going to talk about some of the old ways that folks are working, some of the old systems that people are using that just aren't either supported or they're just not fitting the bill for what they need. And we're going to talk a little bit about some of the new things that people are doing that are really innovative and, and leveraging a lot of the modern technologies that are out there. We're going to really focus in also on asset inventory. What are some of the things that people are doing? What are some of the, the typical holes that we see in processes and ways to better manage inventories. And then also the impact for when you do an FCA on your budget and your master plan, your long-term forecasting. And then we're gonna look at ways forward, ways that you can put things into practice today and really work on a move forward, uh, move forward plan. And let's jump in. So let's start with that loss of that institutional knowledge. What that typically means in organizations is th there's a handful of people on your team that know where stuff is. This ha happens a lot. This happens in, in many of the organizations that I meet with or, or I see at a conference um, and, and people reach out to me and, and we have these discussions about, you know, they've got a handful of people on the team that are the ones that just know where everything is. And, and I, I often see them pointing at their head. And they say, yeah, it's, it, most of it's up here. They're looking at, at, at their team and saying, my gosh, if I lose these people, it's, it's 80 years worth of institutional knowledge combined, or it's 100 years worth of institutional knowledge combined. But, but those are the people that also know where stuff is when something goes sideways. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. But the other challenge is this. It's how do you get your new team members up to speed? So you've got new team members that are coming on and what's the processes in which you can, you can get them up to speed. And I'll show you some different ways that you can manage that process too. But at the end of the day, it's all about getting those people up to speed as fast as possible so they hit the ground running. The other challenges are always this, and I mentioned this or touched on this a little bit ago, is everybody's got a handful of what we call Bob. Bob's the one that knows where everything is. Bob's the person that everybody calls. Bob's the one that, that his phone rings off the hook or he gets those calls in the middle of the night from third shift or, or he gets that call from another site because he used to work at that site, whatever. The combination thereof, Bob knows where everything is. 
the, but the other challenge is Bob also knows where all of your equipment's located typically. He's the one person that knows that, that special thing you've got to do on that piece of equipment too, or the band-aids that have been put on that piece of equipment over the years to really keep it up and going. The other challenge is that when something does go sideways, you've got a pipe burst, you've got a gas leak, whatever, he's the one that also knows what ceiling tile to pop, where that isolation valve is that serves those particular classrooms or those individual rooms in a building. He, he knows because he was there when some of that stuff was, was installed over the years. The other thing that he typically was, would know is what changed in the building over time. Buildings change, they're always changing. Um, and, and those changes mean stuff moved. So in many cases, he was there you know, 30 years ago when, when walls were moved or, or a floor was renovated or, or classrooms were, were either shrunk or, or they increased, they moved pipes, whatever. But he was there and he understands what moved and what the consequences thereof. But what do you do when, when Bob walks into your office and sits down in that chair and says, listen, you know, my wife and I were talking over the weekend and, and we're, gonna, we're gonna retire. You know, I'm going to retire at the end of this year. Or I'm going to retire this summer when school's out. The, it's usually a couple of things. It's the deer in the headlights look where, oh my goodness, I, I knew this time was coming. I wasn't ready for it. And now it's it's here. And the, and when I, when I hear that from someone, I think of it kind of like that gas pump. Every, every day, every minute, every hour is one day closer or one minute closer to that person's last day. But the, the flip side of that is people know that it's also coming. They planned a little bit for it, but, but then again, it's still, it's the realization that he's leaving. And all that institutional knowledge traditionally walks with them. And that's a lot of, a lot of time. That's a lot of, I call that, that boots on the ground, that field knowledge that that person has. And again, it's, it really comes down to what's in that person's head in many cases. But how do you capture that information? How do you take custody of that information so that the next person that comes in is, isn't guessing that they also know where that stuff is? And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that in a few minutes, but here's, here's a, the reality. Roughly 30% of facilities team members are, are in that retirement window. And this, this number goes up and down year over year, but that's, that's a big number. But again, what, Think about the handful of people that are on your team that are in that retirement window. And don't just look at the number of years. Look at the, look at the amount of institutional knowledge that they, they got in their head. So if you've got three people, you know, and again, it's, they represent 30 years. I mean, do the math, 30 years each, all right? That's a big number that's about to walk out that door. So again, it's about planning. It's about capturing that stuff before they leave. Because again, every day, every day that you wait is one day closer to their last day. And, and then there's the, again, it's the loss of that institu institutional knowledge. How does that translate in, in your organization? So think about it from this perspective. If, if I've got a handful of people that are on my team, they're about to leave and something goes sideways, something goes sideways, who knows where that thing is or that isolation valve is, or who knows where, where you know, when the, the ground was ripped open and you repiped stuff that it's actually over here is where the lines run. They were there when the hole was open. So they remember that stuff. So again, think about those types of things. When something goes sideways, who knows how to fix that? That's, that's just a reality that so many organizations are facing right now. And this is what that means. When something goes sideways, they're the people who know where to shut that isolation valve off. They are the ones that know where the main is. They're the ones that know that the isolation actually is running up a chase or in a chase and it adjusts, it affects the Southeast corner of floors one and two, or maybe the basement because they were there when you guys had a leak 20 years ago or, or whatever, they found that, they know where that is. They also oftentimes are the people when you walk down a hallway and you look up and you see the little blue dots, the red dots and yellow dots on the ceiling grid, they're the ones that put those up there. They're the ones that know what that means. 
They're the ones that that's their handwriting written on that little dot or written on the ceiling grid. They're the ones that were there. Many orgs are starting to put up labels, like real labels and putting them up there. Um, I talked to a, a gentleman the other day that said they've actually got etched labels. Or they've got metal labels that are actually screwed into the ceiling grid with what's in there. Again, if you don't have that kind of stuff, then you're relying on somebody's institutional knowledge, what's in their head. They just know. The other challenge is, again, there's some steps you can take. And these are some you may be doing now, but these are some others to think about outside of that box too, is proactively start documenting that information. Think about what does that one person know and then capture that, write it, write it down, document that, but document it so everybody has access to that. Also, scan and digitize all your information. Get rid of all those, those paper drawings. Get rid of all that stuff that's, that's those rolls of drawings that are behind Bob's desk. That's his drawing set. Scan those in so everybody can access those. Also, think about technologies from the standpoint of user-friendly. I, I cannot stress this enough. If the system's not easy, your team's not gonna use it. If it's a difficult system, it's a pain in the behind, they're, they're just not gonna get you, they're not gonna use it. And also think about it from the perspective of mobile first. Everybody on your team has a smartphone, or vast majority of your team, I should say, has a smartphone but make sure that they can access the stuff to do their job. So all think of technology from the standpoint of it's a tool. It's a tool in their toolbox, just like a wrench that helps make their job easier. So they'll be able to find the information that they need to, to, to do the job that they need to do. All your information in one spot, single source of truth, everything can be accessed through one hub where everybody can access it to do their job. But also think about your new hires. Uh, most of the folks, the younger folks coming in, they're very tech savvy. So hire tech savvy people that are gonna be able to step in and re really leverage those tools. But again, the other thing is when you get those new hires in and they're on board, go from, instead of it being months and months and months, six months, a year, or 18 months of training to weeks. If you have everything documented where everybody knows where everything is in your buildings, all, all the information associated with your buildings, that, that ramp up time just shrunk because now they're gonna have access day one. But again, give instant access day one. They walk in the door, they're hired, okay? Day one, they can know where all the mechanical equipment is, all your shutoffs, all the changes, the historical changes that have happened on your buildings. You, you can do that with technologies that are available today. And then they can focus in on the stuff, their core competencies, doing their job, be an electrician, be a plumber, be an HVAC tech. They can go out there in the field, find the stuff that they need, find the equipment locations, diagnose what they need to do and fix it. Not dig trying to find out what was what. They can see all the historical information all at their fingertips, all on their phone. You can do that stuff today. The other challenge is labor shortages. Let's, let's really dive into this. They, I heard a stat the other day that said for every five people retiring, there's only two people coming in. Think about that. That's not sustainable. So I'm a huge advocate, staunch advocate for skilled trades, getting people to really pursue, look at pursuing, a, especially younger folks, pursuing a career in skilled trades. There's just not enough people coming in to backfill. So what happens is people are taking, I find their job hopping. They're, they're get it, they'll get an offer down the street to make five bucks an hour, eight bucks more an hour than they're making where they currently are. So again, it makes the market even more competitive to get those handful of people that are out there. And the more rural you are, the less that pool, or the more that pool shrinks or is shrunk. So again, again, everybody's really struggling trying to find people, but there's resources. Leverage some of those resources. Look at your local trade organizations. Look at your local chapters of IFMA. Look at trade publications. Look at job posting sites. Post some of your jobs on some of those job boards that are trade specific. Also, look at high school internship programs. I, I've talked to several folks that have started, a, they've reached out to their local high schools and they've actually started an intern program even over the summer 
They'll pull kids in, have them job shadow with a plumber, an HVAC tech, an electrician, and they'll move every couple of weeks to really get them interested in, in the skilled trades. Also think about it from the perspective of an apprenticeship program. Have you considered that? Um, think about if, you, if you're in a community college setting or even a higher ed setting, do you offer any kind of trade programs? Leverage those students, leverage the faculty. I talked to a gentleman up in, in the Boston market uh, just a couple of weeks ago, and he was telling me that they are leveraging all, their trade school. They're actually leveraging all the students. They're leveraging the, the, the instructors. It's on the job training, right? And again, it's that opportunity for those kids who are going through those types of programs. So reach out to your local trade schools, reach out to your local community colleges and give, offer that on the job training. Right? That's a huge, huge resource. If you're union-based, leverage relationships with your unions to, to get creative. I'll share one story. It was, it was an actual organization, it's all union-based. They reached out to their union representation and said, listen, we've got a lot of people who are going into that retirement window that are Bob. They're the people who've been there for a long time. So what they did is they, the union allowed them and worked with them to create a separate job category that all those people who are getting ready to transition into retirement, they move them into this other bucket, all right? A new job classification, it allowed them to, to cut their hours back to 26 hours. They actually got a pay bump as well, 26 hours. They could do it in four month increments and renew up to four times. Think about that. They can renew them up to four times at four month increments. What that did is now allowed them to open up that job opening over here so now they can post that job for the guy who just moved into that that other other uh, category and it gives them 16 months potentially to cross train that person once they hire them 16 months that is invaluable that's an outside the box really creative way to work with the unions i thought that was genius um also what other kind of cooperative partnerships are there out there i've heard what, even from the apprenticeship program where are programs where an organization will work with other uh, businesses in their market to share those resources. So they'll split the resources and everybody is leveraging those HVAC techs. Everybody's leveraging that plumber or that electrician and they're sharing those resources. I thought that was, that's really great. Also job fairs. Think about, are you posting, are you going out and, and attending job fairs? Are you in your community? Also military relationships, reach out to your local recruiting office, ask them about opportunities to potentially bring in military who are, who are transitioning out of the military that are gonna be out in the workforce. Leverage that. They're no more, they're, they are fantastic workers coming out of the military every single day. And they, a lot of them will be in your backyard. The other thing is, let's really dive into the old way versus the new way. I, I touched on this at the very beginning. Uh, many organizations are struggling with this. Uh, old systems, legacy systems that, that just aren't supported anymore. Um, or they're, they're only going to be supported for another year or two years. Well, that's, that's rough. That's really rough. And what do you do? Uh, again, it kind of goes back to that deer in the headlights. Oh my goodness, I got that email from that company and they're no longer gonna support this. So a lot of that heavy lift to transition over to another system can be, can be tough. It can be really time consuming. The other challenge is that, that can you even migrate out of those old systems? I've heard that some folks really had to go in and reinvent a wheel, redo everything. Again, it can be a pretty good, big lift, but Part of the other challenge is documenting that information. How are, I, talk, I touched on this earlier, how are you documenting information? If you're documenting it in an old system, a lot of times that won't be able to be migrated into new systems. So again, just kind of think about how you're capturing information today and can it be migrated into new systems? Some of the new systems are 100% mobile first or they're, they're accessible in the field. Let's face it, your team's in the field. Most of the time, they're not sitting at a desk. They're in the field, they're on a roof, they're in a mechanical room, they're in an electrical room, they're, they're out on a site someplace, they're in the field. 
And just kind of think about it this way. Does the system you're using today require them to go back to an office, require them to go back and sit like the guy on the left there, go back to an office, uh, try to remember what his password is. We all do it. Try to remember what my password is. Oh, shoot, that's not it. Let me hit recover password. Or do they pull their phone out of their pocket or grab their iPad and they're doing like the guy on the right? Right. Again, it's again, it's really to focus in on old way versus new way. And it's, it's not to knock any particular system by by any means. People have got things that work for them. But again, is is it able to transition forward or move forward? forward. But it really also starts out with this is how accurate is that database? Is it is it complete? Is it missing stuff? And we'll, we'll really dive into that right here. And and what I've oftentimes found is a lot of the stuff that's in a system is, is just off. It's missing stuff. It didn't get updated. Uh, 20 to 40 percent of the assets just haven't been field verified or they haven't been added because they've been replaced or they've been decommissioned or they've moved or we've repurposed it or now it's not in this building, it's in this building over here, or it's just new, but it hasn't been documented, right? Stuff happens, it, it moves all the time. I, I was talking to a school yesterday and she said, you know, we, we didn't document that we updated all of our exhaust fans on one of the buildings. They actually updated it to a, a, a bigger fan and, and no one knew, they, it's just, they didn't knew because what happened was the guy that was supposed to document that they had like a 911 they running over to another building for something and he, he just forgot but but that's the in facilities you know how it goes many times it's a fire drill everybody's running around they're they're going from job to job to job they're bouncing over here and sometimes you know stuff just happens and it gets it gets skipped or they miss it or they forget about it it, it happens but but the reality is that Oftentimes it ends up looking a little like this. Stuff's missing. I, you know, we did. We started to capture a, a, the model number. Or maybe we put in the name of it, but I didn't have time to put the the serial number in or model or or what floors it in, what buildings, whatever. I mean, stuff ends up missing. Well, again, remember that new person coming in. This is what they get. So they're getting inaccurate or, or missing stuff and. It, it takes them longer to find stuff because a lot of this stuff ends up being missed. And, and it, again, it just, it happens, but this is just the reality that a lot of organizations are in, but, but this is what you want. You want those holes to be filled and, you know, you may not be able to update the whole thing today, but when you're up there and you're replacing a belt or a filter, or you're doing a PM on something while I'm there, you know what, Hey, I'm going to add some more information. So it, it's built off of constantly. But you can't really do that if you can't even access it in the first place in the field. So think about it from that perspective. I'm out in the field, I'm doing a PM on an HVAC unit and I'm, I'm swapping out stuff, I'm greasing stuff, I'm, I'm replacing filters, I'm, I have to replace a bell or whatever. I'm doing work on this, I'm doing a PM on this as well, all right? While I'm there, you know what, I've got the door open or, oh, you know what, here's the, here's the serial number. Let me see if it's in there. Oh, it's not, let me add it real quick. You can do that and then hit save. And in modern technology, you can hit save and then everybody can see it. So again, everybody's on the same page. So it doesn't matter that it's Bob that knows, everybody now knows. Everybody knows all the same stuff. So everybody's on the same page. So not everybody's having to call Bob or not everybody's having to lean on somebody else. Everybody's on the same page. Everybody's looking at the same stuff. And now they can make informed decisions and, and really, really do a better job of, of servicing that particular equipment. But the other challenge is always this, well, not always, but vast majority of the time I hear is equipment is, is missing or, or I don't even know where it is. All right, and again, it's that leaning on that one guy who does know where everything is. So do you know where all your equipment's located? And I'm not talking about just the big stuff. I'm talking about the little stuff too. And oftentimes I go into a mechanical room when I'm doing a site walk and the, according to the equipment list, it says, oh shoot, there's four pieces of equipment in this mechanical room. Well, I count four before I even literally step in the door. It's a massive mechanical room. To me, that just means stuff got missed. It's missing. So can you easily add that? And we'll, we'll talk about that here in a second, but if you don't have tools right now that you can add that is what, think about what's my process 
to add that. So all the jockey pumps, the expansion tanks, all the other stuff that's in that room, all the pot feeders, all of that stuff that's in there that's not in my list, how do, what's my current, current way of adding that to the system? A lot of times it's just writing it on a sticky note or, or writing it on a notepad and putting it in my shirt pocket and, oh, shoot, I forgot to do that. And, oh, you know what? I can't even remember what I wrote here or I can't even read my own writing. Again, if they don't have a way to do it right then and there, a lot of times that stuff just gets missed. And, again, it, what that really means is it's just adding to the, to the problem in, in a lot of instances. The other challenge is, how, is you, how often is your team climbing up on a roof? How often are they popping ceiling tiles and, and trying to find stuff? I, I, I do this all the time when we do site walks, you know, and we don't have a, I, I can see in the ceiling grid that there's, there's a unit. I think there's a unit up here because I see, I see the opening over here. There's a dot over here. So I start popping ceiling tiles and I start trying to figure out what's where. And what happens is I end up popping this tile up directly above me. No, nope, I got to move the ladder down. Oh, I still can't see. Oh, you know what? It's in the next room. And I'm spending all that time popping ceiling tiles, trying to figure out where stuff is. Or I climb up on a ladder, pop the roof hatch. I go out on the roof and then I realize, oh, shoot, I need belt number one, two, three, four, five. I have to go down, back down the ladder. I have to go back and see if I even have one in the warehouse, in the storeroom. Oh, I don't. So now I've got to go to the Granger site. i got to order it. What if I were able to open that up on my phone or on my tablet and say, oh, you know what? I need belt one, two, three, four, five. I go to the, go to the shop, grab it, and then go up the ladder. Capturing that information in real time when your team's up there saves a lot of time from them having to go up and do all that stuff that I just mentioned. Again, it's about time. And your team doesn't have a lot of time in those cases. They're running around like crazy. But the other challenge is a lot of folks have this type of stuff too, just old equipment. You know, it, we're not always replacing equipment on, on a schedule. We replace it in many cases when it's just, it, it died, right? And everybody knows that, that it takes a long time in many cases to get the, the replacement equipment. Um, right now, it, it can be tough to get units because supply chain issues or any number of different factors. But, but again, it's stuff is going to break. And when it breaks, how long is it going to take for me to be able to find that? And a lot of folks are just having to put Band-Aids on stuff because they're, they're delays. Other folks I talk to have been waiting up to a year or longer. I talked to one gentleman that, that he had a, actually had a chiller go out in one of their buildings. They've been renting one. It's been sitting on a trailer, plugged in on a trailer. He's had it for over 18 months. The new one is supposed to be coming in here this summer, but 18 months, he's been paying $10,000 a month in rental fees, $10,000 a month. Again, stuff doesn't break on your schedule. But again, it's, it's, it helps us to really, really maintain and do the best we can with the stuff that we've got. But also, again, your teams are on the move. They're on a roof. They're up on a lift. They're, they're on, you know, climbing up ladders in the middle of the winter. Uh, I mean, they're all over the place. So again, having that mobile access to where all the stuff they need to fix that thing, that's critical. It just saves time. And those t that every minute adds up to hours. And sometimes it's, it can save them hours and hours a week. So what steps should you do to take and, and really keep that database updated and accessible? Well, let's, let's jump in here. You got to think about ditching the old ways. The, think about the processes that, that are really taking up a lot of that time. Sometimes it's just, I got to go up and down the stairs. I got to go up and down the ladders. Sometimes it's, you know, I forgot my password. I, I've got to go all the way back to the shop. What, whatever the process is for you, think of that as the old way, or what are you spending all that time on? And then think of it from the new ways. New ways are, again, mobile. Your, your team's out in the field. They're, they're running around like crazy. They're, they're able to pull their phone out of their pocket, take a photo of a unit, take a photo of the serial number, uh, access that information wherever the heck they are from their pocket. They pull their phone out, they grab that iPad and take photos and document it. And the, the most important thing is when they document it, they hit save and everybody on the team can see it. 
I cannot stress that enough. Everybody's on the same page. They can do it today. There's technology today that can do that. And I'll share some of that in a minute. But imagine having access to all of that equipment, all those details, make, model, serial number, belt sizes, all this stuff, even be able to record a video of that one unit that that one person knows everything about, have them record a video of it with their own voice and hit save so the next person doesn't have to reinvent a wheel. I can actually listen to Bob saying, hey, you know what? You, the, the the reset switch is actually up close to the wall. It's on the back, so you got to reach your hand back around beside that unit. And it's it's I got a little sharpie mark back there. I, I may spend hours trying to find where that reset switch is. All right, but if I have a video or I can I have a diagram, it's all with an arrow saying it's right back there. Everybody will be able to see that. Think about that. Everybody knows where all of your stuff is, and it's all available at their fingertips. So th this is a, a really, really powerful, I think, story that, that illustrates how important it is to find and know where all that equipment is, know all your assets, all your shutoffs, all of that information. This is a, a school district out in California, okay? It was a Saturday. They had a, a unit on the roof catch on fire. Fire department rolls up to the building. Uh, they call the, the emergency number for the school district, the on-call person. She shows up and they're like, listen, we can't start dumping water on this unit because it's on fire. We need to kill the power first. So what do they do? She pulls her phone out of her pocket and she goes, uh, uh, two seconds, let me see here. Okay, it's, it's in this room right here. You gotta go through the door and it's on the corner. The room's filled with smoke. You gotta go down, open this door. They go down there, she unlocks the door, goes through there and the, the fire department goes in there, it's breaker, the second breaker down on the right, breaker number four. Trips the breaker, powers out, they put out the fire. Comes out and the, 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 uh, the fire department sits there and he goes, how the heck did you do that? She goes, oh, I did it right here on my phone. He said, what? Yeah, I, I have all the shutoffs mapped out right here on my phone. He, he said, I wish every school had that. Can you do that today? In your current situation, can you do that today? Can a first responder roll up to your building and find all of your shutoffs, have access to all your shutoffs? You can give access to your custodian. It doesn't matter. But the people who are on site can access where all of this stuff is and share that with a first responder. You can do that today. You can do that today. There are technologies that you can do that. I'm going to show you what that looks like here in a minute. But how does this impact how does, how does accurate information, knowing where all of your equipment is, having all of your documentation in line for all of your equipment, all of your assets impact FCAs and your long-term master planning? Well, accurate information means you're gonna have more accurate FCA results. So your, your FCA is again, condition. It's not just mechanical equipment, of course, it's structural. It's all the other systems within your building. But if the more accurate you can start out with, the more your accurate your results are gonna be. The master planning, again, how do you plan for stuff in your master plan that isn't even documented or it's not accounted for? And we'll, we'll talk about that here in just a second. And what that really starts out with is think about how, more ac how much more accurate your system will be or your FCA results will be when you have accurate asset inventory. Also, an FCA ad addresses structural conditions, uh, utility mapping, master planning. It, it, these are all the things that this impacts, as well as the frequency. How often are you updating your FCA? How often are you updating the results as your building changes? Many organizations are doing FCAs every two to three plus years, right? An FCA is a snapshot in time. This isn't a slide on FCAs. It's just, it's a snapshot on in time. So as your building changes, it's critical that you also update your FCA so that all of that is now current year over year over year. So as your building conditions change, your FCA should also change and you should be able to adjust that for your, for your master plan based off those changes. But an FCA, again, covers a lot of different things, building systems, structural, the building envelope, interior elements, 
the site and grounds. Again, the stuff between the buildings, not just the stuff in the buildings. It also addresses some of the compliance things. Documenting uh, the documentation review, all of the stuff associated with your building, but it also provides some cost estimation on replacement. All right. Also provides some information about end of life dates, expected end of life dates. That doesn't mean you're going to replace it at the end of that life. It means this is your expectation of how long that unit's going to still run. But again, units aren't on a schedule. They break when they break. So again, it's critically important for you to, to update that information and also maintain your equipment so you get the maximum out of that equipment over time. So what the consequences of inaccurate FCAs or updates or, or lack of updating your FD, FCA results is misallocation of resources. You, you can't allocate resources for something that's not even in your list or not even on your radar. And so what that does is it makes your budgets really unrealistic, but, but also the challenge can be it, 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 it can really put a strain on your ability to address those critical things, those big things, because in many systems, it's a snowball effect. So if I've got an HVAC system, it's all tied together. It's like a snowball. One thing breaks and it's like a, it's like a chain reaction in some cases, but that can have a, this, this whole process of having inaccurate information can really put a, strain, a really strong strain, I should say, on your long-term master planning. And again, you're, you're looking at this not only from short-term, near-term, you're looking at the long-term impacts of that. So advantages of accurate FCAs for, for budgets of master planning is it allows you to make those data-driven real decisions so you're, you're gonna have real information, live information. It also can help you really identify your facility needs and prioritize those. Really look at the prioritize and, and be able to adjust that based off real accurate information. And this will impact you for your long-term financial planning and budgeting. And also help you really be able to sit down and figure out that long-term strategy and your overall vision for your organization long-term. So again, it's, it really comes down to what do I do? So you got to start now. Think about that from, from all the different things that I mentioned, you got to start now. You got to think of, I'm losing people uh, to retirement. I'm losing people to the labor shortage. I'm, I'm getting ready to do an FCA. Uh, I, I'm working on my master plan. It's a snowball. All of these different components will help you make those better accurate decisions. So what does that look like? You got to keep up with your building changes. Your buildings are changing. They don't change all the time, but they do change. So updating that and keeping current records of what you've got out in the field, keeping current all of your building information all in one spot so everybody can see that. That's critical. But what that usually starts out with is something that looks like this. All these different roles represent changes to your building. So this is a paper I, these are all the one. All these roles are represent a change to your building. This means not just walls move, mechanical stuff move. So again, all of these represent a change to your building. So who has access to that? How do they access it? Are they rolling stuff out on a on a plan a plan table? They're trying to figure out. Oh, that's not the set I need. I'm going to go grab the next roll and the next roll. But but what I just said is they're grabbing the next roll in that room, off site meaning, or I'm sorry, off the roof. They're trying to find the stuff that they need to work on the unit that's on the roof when they're standing in a plan room someplace. You know, there's a better way. You want them to be able to access all that stuff while they're on that roof. You want them to not have to come off that and go into this plan room and start digging through and trying to find the renovation drawings or, or whatever they need. But again, many folks have stuff that looks like this. You got a plan room, all right? And, and again, some folks are taking steps to start to, to start uh, uh, scanning stuff in. Funny, not funny story. Uh, one of the, the organizations that I met with, it was actually in the Northwest, they actually had uh, students scanning all of their drawings. So again, students were coming in, they would scan all the drawings in, and then they were rolling them back up and they put them in these big bins, uh, big uh, trash cans, round trash cans, had fluorescent signs all over them that said, do not trash, do not trash not trash 
and they were putting them all in there after they scanned them they were putting them in these in these big big drums all right it's friday they all go home the third party contractor that comes in and cleans the the rooms didn't read the signs on them dumped them all in the in the the trash can outside in the big dumpster they all come in on Monday morning, all the tubs are empty and they're actually nested into each other. There's nothing in them. They're like, oh my gosh, gosh, what the heck happened? They go out in the dumpster and find all these within an hour of the trash company showing up with the truck to dump that dumpster. They're dumpster diving. Again, it's a process thing. They didn't know it was an accident, okay? But again, all of this is paper. This is paper and the struggle is, you gotta go digital. Just do the best you can to get this stuff digital so that everybody can access it. But the other challenge is not just get it digital, but get it organized digitally so you can find the information. If I scan stuff in and it leave, you leave the record, the same name that it was when the scanner scanned it, no one's gonna be able to find that. Or if it's a you know, 30, 40, 100 page PDF, it can be tough to be able to find that information because is it named right? Is it by discipline, is it even by building? All of that information could be no different than the paper if I can't find it. So again, you gotta make sure that you get your team can access it, but relying on just scanning is, isn't enough. It has to be organized in a way that your team can find it. And remember what I said, in the field, your team's running around like crazy. Not just the facilities team, think about it from the design construction side. They need to access all the historical stuff too. So how long is it taking them to go into the plan room and find stuff? If you have it all organized so that everybody can find it, it benefits everyone, everybody in your department, everybody on your team. But also start documenting where that equipment's located. When they're up on the roof, make sure that they have a way to document it so that everybody sees it. Capture all that information on the go as they go. And as they're changing stuff, they can change it real time so everybody can see that information. The other thing is, let's look at what that really could look like within your organization. And in many cases, this will check off a lot of boxes for folks. So imagine that I'm, I, I open up my phone or I grab my tablet and I, I click on an app, just like I order food or I order a lift or, or anything. And I click on a building, I'm opening up a dashboard and I, I wanna see the drawings for the Southeast corner of my building and I can, tap on it and I can see all the historical drawings for a building. And it drills down to the complete set, not just your architectural, full MEP. And you can see all the historical changes all layered so everybody can see what happened in the Southeast corner from the day the building was built to till today. All of the historical stuff, all in one spot. You can do that today. Now, imagine I'm, uh, I'm one of your team and I, I walk up to a unit and, and, and I'm, I look at a generator, for instance, I get, I tap on an app, I, I tap on a QR reader and, and everybody scanned a QR code anymore. You scan a QR code on a unit, on the generator, and I see all the information for this generator. I can see make, model, serial number, I can see all the, the, all the manuals, I can see the warranty information. I can see all the photos. I can see all of that all from my phone while I'm standing at the unit. Matter of fact, I, oh, we're missing the serial number. Let me go ahead and add that real quick and hit save. Everybody can do that today. That's what technology is available today. The other thing I always say is shutoffs can be a nightmare. They're all over the place. I mean, goodness. I, I talk to folks all the time and, and how, many, how many isolation valves do you have in your buildings? They're all over the place. But if I click on a building, and then I click a button that says shut offs, right? And then I go to a floor, I go to a building, I go to a floor, I can see an individual area. And if I wanna find the, the backflow for a part of a building, I can tap on it and I can even put in instructions. This is, this is for this building, it does X, it shuts off this, it shuts off that, whatever. Even your isolation valves, gas, water, power, all your electrical panels, all your gas shut offs, all your water, all your isolation valves, all of that documented so everybody on your team can see that, but also that first responder can see that if you share access to them. It allows your team to make informed decisions. Everybody's looking at the same stuff. Everybody's looking at the stuff that they need to do their job. 
You can do that today. Now, what that means is you're utilizing smart building technology. So buildings have gotten smarter over the years. The newer, obviously, buildings are, are all getting really, really smart, but it allows you to le leverage AI and machine learning. It allows you to leverage technology, learn, and, and be able to adapt and, and get the information you, you need to do your job instantly, wherever you are. So if something goes sideways in the building at two o'clock in the morning when something breaks, you can roll out of bed, grab your phone, you can access it, and you can even share that information with the person who's standing in the door before you even put your shoes on. You can do that today and access all the information, all your equipment, all your shutoffs, but everything all in one spot. Everybody can access that. This is a true, and this is a, a statement that we heard from a gentleman that, that from IBM Consulting that I thought was fantastic. It's an adrenaline shot for your team's productivity. Think about that. Your team is already, already usually I hear it's you're down two, three, uh, even 20, 30% headcount, all right? That your team can now access all the information to do their job. So it allows you to really make those informed decisions and get some of that time back. Right, so they can go do more stuff to maintain your buildings. But working with other softwares, it's it's creating links that go between them, meaning URLs that go between different systems. That's a modern approach. Linking apps on your phone to each other for a specialized thing, going to your work order system or jumping between apps. Everybody on that I know anymore, you, you've got a smartphone and you'll have multiple apps open and you just toggle between them. It's not like the old days where you have to have it go right here, right there, no, no. But capturing and making sure that the information matches up, all right? If you have an asset number, your asset number should match in both systems. But everything is all in one spot and everybody has access to that information wherever they are. And again, have all of that information linked back to those other systems, all in one spot. So what this really means for a team is the benefits are always improve productivity of your team. You're running, you're running down headcount in many, many instances. So again, maximizing their time and, and taking some of that burden that they have, those time sucks that are really sucking their time away it really gives them some of that back and now allows them to do more in their day, which makes their life easier. Also think about it, risk mitigation. The, the faster you can shut that water valve off, is, a, is it's gonna minimize the amount of damage done to that building. It's the difference between a mop and replacing drywall or even shutting a building down for months at a time while you do that repair. Also, think about it from the knowledge capture, having the ability to capture all that institutional knowledge and document it so everybody can see that. But this is your business continuity moving forward. It's the information now lives with the building. It doesn't have to just live with a handful of people or in their heads. So let's take some questions, Matt. Uh, David, uh, that was fantastic. That was a lot of really great concrete information, and I think our audience is already going to take a lot away from that. That was fantastic. Uh, it is time for the Q&A portion of the event. Uh, for our audience, there's still plenty of time to submit a question using the Ask a Question window to the left, and let's take a look at our first one. Uh, we're still. The first question is, we're still struggling to keep people with prevailing wage rates, and we're losing decades of field knowledge. How do you recommend we approach something like this when we've already lost so much information? Yeah, I, I cannot stress this enough. Start start as fast as you can. You, you've got to think of it as you're going to lose people. Attrition happens. But the every day that you wait is one day closer to not only the person retiring, but the potential of losing your, your next person in line that knows where that stuff is. The, the prevailing wage side is it, it can be tough. I've heard a lot of organizations are getting creative with bonuses or maybe it's additional PTO that they're offering. It's creating that cultural of environment where your team, it's not, a lot of times it's not all about just the money, it's about the culture. They're building that and really taking care of their people. 
and creating new ways to, to maintain them. Sometimes it's benefits, sometimes it's a bonus structure. I've heard a few folks that are actually doing it from the standpoint where they'll have a pooled bonus that the school board or, or the chancellor has approved. That pooled bonus is for the team. So if they achieve certain goals, they set individual and team goals and you can either get some individual bonuses, but also the overall team approach. That creates that cohesive team to achieve that, that goal. Um, I, I hope that helps, but but again, it's it's creating ways to to maintain your team and creating ways that your team wants to stay. It's about that retention side. Okay. And then uh, our next question is: How does the software help to calculate uh, the depreciation of equipment? Yeah, we'll have to take that offline. Uh, there's different ways that you can do that. That's traditionally handled in an FCA itself. Uh, we're, we're not a, we don't produce FCAs, we do field capture and things like that. But FCA organizations traditionally will, will be able to do that. They'll put end of life dates, they'll put the, the expected end of life date, or replacement costs and things like that. One thing to keep in mind too, when you're thinking of when they attach an end of life date or that replacement cost, that replacement cost that they're building in there is also current rates. I've heard that some of the challenges right now are um, from several of my clients anyway, they're saying that what was put in their FCA from three years ago is now 20, 30% higher. It's just what it is. Uh, it's just, it costs more to get some of those those specific items. Other things that you need to be, be mindful of in an FCA is, um, is it accounting for things like you got a crane rental or a replacement uh, uh, unit while it's gonna be down for a week, you have to rent it, it's X number of dollars or even things like, you know what, to replace that unit, we actually have to rip a wall open to get it out. So just think of those intangible or additional things, I should say, that may or may not be in your FCA. And, and you've got to pad those numbers and realize that that's a snapshot in time. Okay. And then uh, kind of in that same vein, uh, our next question is, uh, we had an FCA done last year and it's missing a lot. How have you seen other schools handle that problem? Um, that phone number right there, call me, <laughs> happy to help. Uh, but, but at the end of the day, you have to field verify against your list and go out and capture that information. Uh, part of what we do is we go out and we'll capture that information. Uh, we document all the missing stuff that's not in your list. Uh, traditionally from the mechanical, um, all the shutoffs, all of that. We're capturing and, and identifying where that is. And then you now have a current list and it's field verified. So it's not just the stuff that's in your list, it's the stuff that maybe it's been replaced and, and anything that's in your list that has been replaced needs to be taken out. So again, it's that field verification is a, is a key thing, but you gotta start, you, you just gotta start doing it and, and moving forward as, as develop your own SOPs and we can help with that. Okay. And then uh, our next question is, uh, I'm down 30% headcount and I'm having to outsource some HVAC PM tasks. Can vendors also get access to these systems? And then what kind of security is there to limit their capabilities? Yeah, I can, I can only speak for, for our system, but, but yes, you can give, you can create a specific vendor group where they have view download only. Um, you could even uh, assign them to a specific site and you can even set a time in there where you uh, delete them out after the project is complete. So say for instance, they're working on a building that's 18 months, you can set a, they only have access to these files for 18 months. Um, but again, you want your, your vendors to be able to access that too, because for every document you don't give them as far as uh, uh, as-built sets, if you're missing a set, that might be the set that shows that there's piping behind the wall before they start ripping walls open and again, everything that you're not showing them can add costs to your to your projects as well. Okay. And then uh, how much time is required by my team to implement a system like this? Well, again, I can only speak for our system, uh, minimal. Our, our team does the lift. We do the site walks, we do all the scanning. I, I have 150 offices in the US and, and we do all that, that heavy lift, that leg work. Uh, minimal effort from your team. Usually we only leverage uh, maybe one of your legacy guys who's been there for a while or your electrician to say he knows that, you know, some stuff's over here or it's in this room. 
uh, over here or, you know, it's on the roof or, or in that little secret squirrel waiting to get back in there. But at the end of the day, our team's opening every door, every, and every floor, um, building to building. We're doing the site walk on the ex exterior as well, capturing all that stuff. But the most important thing too is um, we show your team how to change things and edit things as they find stuff too. If we miss, you know, a, a, an electrical panel that's tucked behind a door, we show the team how they can add it. And again, as soon as they add it and hit save, everybody sees it. Okay. And then I, I think you might have just touched on this a little bit in your previous answer. But our next question is: Do systems like this also map the things between? the things between buildings and then like on the exterior, like the exterior perimeter? Yeah, yeah, I, th I think that's something that a lot of organizations don't think about and it's it's site plans. It's what's between the buildings. It's, uh, think about it from like your sewer clean outs, your backflows, uh, your, your electrical pull boxes, all of those things that are between the buildings. Also irrigation systems, backup generators, all the stuff that's outside I think that's equally important to the stuff that's that's inside in many cases is when something's going sideways, you need to know where the main is as well. So having access to that on a site plan and, and having everything documented so you can click on a location of a water valve and it opens up and it shows you the photos. Maybe it shows uh, where it is in relation to the building, but on the site plan and being able to access that, all, that information, I think that it always should be included in our system. We, we do that. Yes. Okay. And then uh, I'm, I'm not seeing anything else come in in the audience side. I wanted to ask if there were any last words or thoughts that you wanted to share with the audience, anything that kind of popped in your brain as you were talking that there wasn't quite time to get to. Yeah, certainly. I think with the, with regards to even the questions, I mean, all great questions. I, I think what, what a lot of organizations struggle with is, is where do we go? Where, what do we do? What, what do we start? And, and I always say that you just need to look at what the gaps are, identify what those gaps are, and start filling them. You know, and some of the systems that you have today may not do that, and that's okay. You know, everybody wants the, the one, one thing to, to solve them all, and, and, and it may not exist. But at the same time, there are a lot of things that you can plug in that will fill those voids and really check off many of the boxes that organizations have. Okay. And then uh, we did have one last audience question, just uh, will this presentation be available to view later? Uh, it looks like we have people that want to share this with their coworkers. Yeah, we're going to actually send out, uh, it'll come from our team. We're, we're gonna send out some information following up on this and we've got some additional documentation we'll send out as well. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. And then I guess I, I did have one last really quick question for any of our audience members who have seen this and who are feeling like inspired or ready to go. What's the very first actionable task that they can take? What's something they can do like this afternoon? What's something they can do by Friday? What's like that first little domino that they could tip over to get the ball rolling? I love that question. Um, I think it, it really comes down to is identify the gaps in your systems. Take a look at, you know, it, and it doesn't have to, when I say systems, I don't necessarily mean software. I mean, look at processes. Is it I'm relying on a handful of people or I've got one person who's kind of the gatekeeper knows where all the stuff is, or maybe it is a legacy system that isn't being supported anymore, or it's just not, not doing what I want it to do. And then actively look for systems that, and again, call me where I'm happy to, to help. Um, our, our number is right on there and we're happy to help guide you in, in some specific directions to check off some of those boxes. Um, I think everybody is uh, in, the, in the facility space. I think it's, it's a unique industry and it's we're all here to help each other. And, and I think that we all, uh, we all know a lot of best practices, but I learn something every day. And I'd love to, love to talk with you and see what we can do to help you um, take that first step in your journey to, uh, to this, this independence of relying on people and paper. Okay. And then, uh, unfortunately, that's about all the time that we have for today. Uh, once again, I'd like to thank David Trask, National Director of ARC Facilities, for sharing his time and expertise with us today. David, again, that was fantastic, and just thank you one more time for being here. That was that was oh, really my pleasure, close. and thank you to the audience. Yeah, uh, we'd also like to thank the sponsor of today's event, ARC Facilities. 
Finally, thanks to all of our attendees for spending some time with us today. Remember that within the next couple of days, ARC Facilities will provide a link to the archived version of this session so that you can watch it again or share it with a colleague. Uh, the recording will also be available on the Spaces for Learning website. Thanks again for tuning in, and this concludes today's event.